wonderful, wonderful singing and worship this morning. Well, we are journeying through Mark, and we come to a, another uh, intriguing miracle of Jesus, the healing of the blind man at Bethsaida. We had kind of a um, unique healing and encounter with Jesus with a Syrophoenician woman <clears throat> a couple of weeks ago, and this is another one that I'm sure you've heard, and uh, if you've been in church a long time and know about, but some um, uniqueness about it, the miracle only occurs in the Gospel of Mark, does not occur in the other Gospels. Now, some uh, think that, well, uh, maybe it's a continuation of the, uh, the deaf and dumb man that Jesus healed just a, a chapter before in Mark. Uh, some say, well, John healed a, um, a blind, it talks about Jesus healing a blind man by a pool in his gospel. Maybe it's connected to that. But um, I really think that it's a standalone miracle of Jesus. Now, another uniqueness about this miracle, and I think this is a key to our message to us today, is that it's the only miracle of Jesus that happens in stages. Most of the miracles of Jesus are automatic, aren't they? They're immediate. Or Jesus says, go home, your, your daughter, your son, your servant's been healed. Or he touches someone and the leprosy goes away immediately. In fact, immediately is a well-used word in Mark. He loves that word uh, to show how powerful Jesus is. But this miracle happens in stages. So that's interesting to me. And as I looked at that, um, I thought that, and, and I looked at what Mark was trying to say in his overall gospel, um, I think it reveals something to us. And, and what, I, what, I think that, what I think it means and why I think Mark placed it right here is that Mark is remembering uh, Peter probably preaching about this miracle, and it's about one's journey towards faith, one's journey towards believing in Jesus. And, you know, we are all on that journey. I was thinking as we were singing those great um, praise songs today, we were singing about how great God is and uh, how wonderful he is and how much he means to us. And I just sensed we were singing that with such fervor and, and really out of our spirit. But we haven't always been there, have we? There is a time in each of your life when maybe you remember not believing, where there's a, a time in your life where you weren't sure about your faith, where, where you doubted. And we, each of you, wherever you are in your faith journey this morning, you've journeyed to that point with God. You've journeyed to that point. And now also think of the gospel story where we are in Mark. The disciples, and we'll say this again in a minute, the disciples are on this journey as well, aren't they? The disciples right now in this first half of Mark, they really don't fully understand who Jesus is. They've, they're kind of trying to figure out who Jesus is. Is he a great teacher, a prophet? Is he the Messiah? And they haven't quite come, I don't think, that he's the Son of God, but they are very soon. And uh, they're questioning the parables. What does this mean? Or what does this healing mean? We're trying to figure this out. Now, next week, we'll talk about the watershed moment in the gospel where we see where they are journeying towards really believing who Jesus really is at Caesarea Philippi. But right now, they're still journeying and questioning as well. So let's look at this, this miracle of Jesus as their journey and our journey towards faith and believing. So the, the little story begins is that as Jesus has again moved, and he's on the move in Mark, now he's in Bethsaida, and 
he uh, comes to this town of Bethsaida, and a caring group of people, a caring group of friends, bring, lead a blind man to Jesus. And the gospel says that they beg him, they beg Jesus to heal him. They care for their friend. They love their friend. And I think one of the themes that I have seen over and over again in this part of the gospel is uh, the importance of people bringing those that they really care about in life to Jesus. And, you know, it's the same in our day now. We have Boy, we have statistics galore now when you look at church growth, when you look how, you know, how to increase the guests and visitors in your church, how to increase attendance, how to help churches grow. And there's so much data now, but you know, the number one way of growing a church is the same as it was 50, 100, 200 years ago. They still say the number one way is you and I personally inviting friends, neighbors, and strangers to come to the church to worship God and to learn about Jesus. That's still the number one way. With all of the technology, with all of the study we've done, you guys going back to school, invite your friends to church. That's the number one way at your workplace, in your neighborhood, around the family table. And we, we see that it's an eternal truth, and we see it in the gospel time after time again. Friends, loved ones, bringing their friends, bringing their families to Jesus. Now, let's think about who they bring. This man that they bring, blind man, first of all, he's a Gentile, just like that Syrophoenician woman. He, um, I think that he is a Gentile, and he has grown up... Um, and become into manhood, and I don't think at this point he knows anything about Jesus. He doesn't know who Jesus is. He somehow hasn't heard about Jesus and his miracles. You know, Jesus is in a different territory, a different town, and uh, yet his friends, I don't know how they got him there. You know, it's like in the old days, hey, I, maybe they've heard of him, but, you know, hey, come with me to the Billy Graham concert. I know you don't, maybe you've heard of him, come and listen to him, or something like that. But they get their blind friend to go, even though he doesn't know Christ at all. And I think that's significant because, think, he comes to Jesus, and this man is unable to see when he first comes to Christ. He's unable to see physically, and he's blinded spiritually, both. He has no idea who he's coming to. Now, um, at this point in the gospel, we said earlier, the disciples are still blind to who Jesus really is. And this is a subplot, something Mark is still talking to us about as well. And we today are blind spiritually before we ever meet and trust Jesus. Anybody that hasn't come to faith yet, who, whose faith hasn't journeyed enough to really believe who Jesus is and to realize what Jesus has done for them through the cross and the resurrection and to get to the point where we ask Christ in our heart and he really becomes Lord and, and we can really lift our voices up like we did this morning in praise. All of us started at some point in at we do not know who Jesus is. We don't know. We are blinded spiritually. We're, we begin our journey of faith, and your friends, your neighbors, your family that haven't asked Christ in their heart yet, they may be at some point on this part of the journey. They, have, they don't know who Christ is. They can't quite get there and believe who Jesus is. They haven't made that decision to cross over in faith to ask Christ in their heart and be changed by the Spirit. And that's kind of where this blind man is. Blind spiritually, blind physically. And so the next part of the narrative is that Jesus, does he, does he just uh, heal him right away in that town? No, the first thing he does, 
it's kind of a beautiful picture. I don't know why more paintings haven't been done of this. I mean, there's no paint, there's no stained glass about this. But I love this image. Jesus takes the blind man by the hand and leads him out of the village into the countryside. Jesus personally touches, befriends, loves this man. He, he wants this man to get to know him. He cares for this stranger, this individual that doesn't know him, doesn't care about him, and he takes him by the hand and leads him out of the town. You know, and it's, it's when, you know, let's think of this spiritually. It's, it's when we allow ourselves to allow Jesus to begin to take us by the hand, when we allow ourselves to be still and alone with God, that the Spirit can begin to speak to us and begin to open our eyes. This is the beginning of the man's physical healing as well. Does it know Jesus? Does it know, you know, in our day, is this guy a quack? Is this, you know, am I going to let this guy try to heal my blindness? Am I going to let this guy touch me? But the beginning is this gentle, uh, th this gentle getting to know the Lord. And, and Jesus knows this, and, and so he gently takes him by the hand and is going to grow him, journey him towards faith, and that's eventually what it's going to take for him to be healed. But it's not all at once. Because he doesn't know the Lord at all. Jesus takes him away from the town. He, he takes him away from the distractions. He takes him away from the crowds. He takes him away of, uh, of, of everything uh, else on his mind and in his heart that will distract him from really focusing on his spiritual and his physical condition, and this conversation he needs to have with Jesus. And again, it's, it's it, it, many times, and we as believers too, we need to get away, don't we, from the distractions of our lives uh, to where we can begin to see Jesus deeper with our own spiritual eyes. Sometimes we need to be forced to do something different out of our routine so the Spirit can talk to us. Um, man, last Sunday afternoon, I was excited. Got home from uh, uh, church, church council meeting. You know, got into my relaxing clothes, hit the couch, and it was Sunday of the PGA Championship, one of my four favorite days of the year, a major in golf, right? And, uh, man, it was going to be a great one. It was ex So I started watching it. And all the leaders got to ready to play the last nine holes. It was a stormy Sunday, if you remember. And we were lucky. We were one of the few areas the power went off. So my TV went off. And I didn't have enough cell phone power to watch the PGA streaming it. So there I was. And so I sat there from about quarter to five waiting. I said, well, maybe I can just catch the last the last holes of the last part of the magazine. And I kept keeping the updates. And, and man, you know, Tiger's making a charge and, and Brooks Cope is hanging on. And, and uh, so I waited and waited. And about 10, 15 that night, the power came on. I missed it all. I didn't get to see any of one of my favorite golf tournaments. But what happened also during that is I, about the midway through that, I said, oh, okay, I guess I might have to do something else to occupy my time. So I pulled out my iPad, which still had power, no, no Wi-Fi. And so I went to the books area, and I was able to read. And so one of the things is I said, well, I got some time on a Sunday afternoon. And I opened up the Bible app, and um, I said, I've, I've been wanting to revisit Hebrews. And so I started reading Hebrews. And so I was able to read through about half of Hebrews and really reflect on that and, and uh you know, what God was saying in that great book and, uh, and you know, had some great quality time that Sunday afternoon. Didn't want to do it. <clears throat> wasn't my plan. Uh, wasn't, you know, I was a very selfish. I was going to watch the golf tournament. But, but circumstances, see what I'm saying, right? Circumstances changed. Time was carved out. Distractions was taken away. And I often thought to myself, Gosh, you know, what, what happened before TV and, 
and, and internet and all of this, when, you know, this is why people read a lot more. This is why people studied the word a lot more. And it was a very, very beneficial time. So this afternoon, I'm going to watch the last part of the golf tournament no, I'm just going to hold But, you know, it, it hopefully it moves us towards um, wanting to go deeper and spend time with Jesus. And that's what Christ is doing, taking this man in a different place so that he can really understand and learn who Jesus is. And in the, next, in the very next story almost, um, you'll see in, in the latter part of... Um, of chapter 8, and we'll talk about it next week, Jesus is going to do the same with the disciples. He's going to be on the move again, and he's going to take him to this little isolated place called Caesarea Philippi that has this great symbolic meaning, and that's where he's going to see how much the disciples are getting it, okay? So that's going on as well. But you know, it, um, it, it also just tells us again, we're on this journey to believing and the next part of the story is, is that Jesus, the great news is, Jesus helps us on this journey to believe in him more. He helps us out. So he gets the man out of the village by himself, and then he uses common, well-known materials, common, well-known medical practices of his day to help this man begin to believe and to begin to understand faith. And he uses things like his fingers and saliva and touch. Common things that, that it, as other people would try in his day to help him to begin to understand that when Jesus adds these things to their modern world, a really godly thing can happen. And that happens in our hearts too, is that God stoops down to our faith level. He stoops down to our feeble faith and helps us understand the great spiritual truths of the Bible and the great spiritual truths of salvation and Christianity. You know, just look in the Gospels. Um, that's what the parables are all about, isn't it? Jesus uses common imagery, common things, common stories, so that he can teach them and us about deep spiritual truths. We can't understand them otherwise. Our human minds can't comprehend them. The whole real, the reason for the incarnation, God becoming man in Jesus Christ, is so we can understand God. The scripture says later in the New Testament that when you see Jesus, you see God perfectly. Somebody asks you, well, who is God? Who, why do you believe in God? What does God look like? All you got to say is go read the Gospels. Jesus is God. That's how we can understand who God is, God's heart, and God's purpose. He puts it in the form that we can understand in our own life. None of us here could, could or cannot, we just can't understand the holiness or the mysteries of God unless God reveals that to us. It's too high for us. It's, it, it, it's too lofty. He's God. We're humans. What we sing about, he, he's given these, these artists of music and, and words the ability to help, help us know and and translate who God is and what that means for our life. Without God revealing that to them, we can't know. The, the main reason for the beauty of our world, the main reason for the infinite universe, it's to point us to the eternal. It's to make us realize this can't happen without a supreme godly being. That's the purpose. Paul will say in Romans, no, no man, no woman is with excuse. Anybody that's never even heard the gospel yet can look around and see creation and see the seasons and see all that's around them. And God does that because so that in their hearts they know somehow, some way, there is a God. There is somebody greater than they are. And then the gospel can come in 
and we, and we explain that in the person and the mission of Jesus. And that makes all the difference. Faith and belief then occur in stages and not all at once. And that's what the story leads into. Jesus puts the, the, the spit on his fingers and rubs the guy's eyes. Kind of gross, isn't it? And, um, and then he says, can you see? And at first the man does not see clearly, does he? He, uh, he sees, he says, no, he says, I, I, I see people, shadows of people walking around, but they look like trees. And Jesus, this was going to be a slow healing, and Jesus knew it. The man was being healed slowly because he was believing slowly. It wasn't Jesus, but it was the man. Jesus was more concerned about when he left this gentleman that the man's faith and belief in him was healed and was strong. He was much more concerned about that than his physical healing of him being blinded. And the disciples the same way again. They're believing slowly concerning who Jesus is and his purpose. And many of us believe slowly. Yeah, I'm kind of hearing this story of Jesus or I'm saved. I'm trying to make Jesus Lord, but I don't know exactly what that means or, or where I am with that. Uh, Lord, help my unbelief, like the one man said. You know, right now, Christianity and faith and the power of the Holy Spirit, it, it, it kind of feels cloudy like, like people that look like trees walking around. It's a little murky. And this story reminds us, hey, that's okay. Faith is a journey. Seeing clearly is a journey. N none of us grasp all of the truths of the Bible all of the truths of following Jesus all at once. Becoming a Christian does not uh, come in an instant mature faith of believing. It comes in stages. Think about those disciples. It would, be, it would take years for the disciples, which, which in the Greek means learners, those who learn, they wouldn't become apostles. Apostles mean those who are sent for years. It was going to take the resurrection, the Holy Spirit, and some training for that to happen. It took three years for one of the most learned men of the Bible, Saul, he has the Damascus Road experience, meets Jesus, becomes saved, but then he goes away for three years and is discipled in the deserts of Arabia before he comes back and he's ready spiritually to be ordained a missionary, the greatest missionary that we've ever known for Jesus. If it takes time for those guys, it's going to take time for us. And that's a part of why Mark is placing this. He's reminding his church and our church that that's the way it is. And so each of us here need to keep on learning. We need to keep on growing. We need to keep on maturing in Jesus until one day we see him face to face. And then we'll know everything. So I say that to say, don't get discouraged that, that sometimes you say, my faith just feels small. That um, sometimes I don't think that I believe enough. Sometimes I feel like I'm failing God. Sometimes I feel like I can't get a handle on this temptation or this sin. It's all a part of the faith journey. And Jesus is there to help you believe in him and trust in him and know him more and more. And it also reminds us that, that we'll receive uh, the awareness and the amount of Christ's power as to the amount of our faith and our belief and no more. It's a lot of it is up to us of how much we want to grow in the Lord. Jesus often says to others that he heals, he says, according to your faith, it shall be done to you. He says that a lot in the Gospels, doesn't he? Uh, according to your faith, you're healed. 
According to your faith, you touched the hem of my garment. According to your faith, daughter, you're healed. According to your faith, this person is healed. And it's the same with us. So I guess one of the main questions uh, is today is where and what stage are you in in your journey of faith? The, the man, the blind man, after Jesus touches his eyes again, I think one, uh, that gradual healing helped the blind man realize this isn't just some other hack that my friends are taking me to. No, no, no this isn't another, uh, in my modern day, another way of maybe this procedure, uh, this superstition is going to work. I'm realizing this is Jesus and he's special, he's from God, he's maybe the Messiah, and Christ is teaching him this, and when Jesus touches him again, the Bible says he sees clearly, he sees clearly, and that's where we want to get in our faith, isn't it? And the first way to see clearly is we, we see Jesus enough to say, I'm going to place my life in, in his life. I'm going to depend on him for the forgiveness of sin. I'm going to depend on him for salvation, and I'm going to journey in life towards making him Lord. And that's why Mark places this unique miracle in Scripture. I know we're all on a journey. Where are you at this morning? At the beginning? Or maybe at the place where you haven't fully believed in Jesus, or you believe and you're trying to make him Lord, or you're trying to figure out, okay, Jesus, how can you be in my everyday life? How can I make you more real? How can you help me with what I'm going through? How can I, how can I look for the a promise of you in the future? And that's where we need to contemplate the word today. We're going to have a prayer in just a minute and want to give you time to think about that. Or think about what does God's word say to you today about your journey of faith. Do you need to step out and ask Jesus to forgive you every sin for the first time and be baptized? Or is Christ calling you to something else? Is he calling you towards a new level in your journey? What's the next step to know him more, to know him better? And we'll think about that during our, um, our, our last song of invitation of commitment this morning. So let's pray as the praise team comes up and, and then we'll, uh, we'll sing and think about what God's saying to us. Lord Jesus, thank you for not giving up on us, uh, but also thank you, Lord, that you have given us everything to, um, to walk this journey of life. Lord, you've, you've given us everything to have faith in you and to help understand your ways. Lord, just um, increase our faith and give us the, the courage to learn and to surrender to you all that we are and all that we have. In your name we pray, Lord. Amen.